Well, <lacht> wir sind hier auf sillyhung.com, dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft Server Laser Komponenten mit Alternativ der IP 149.22.127.134 äh, und wir schauen jetzt weiter bei 17 Minuten 57 Sekunden das Video 28C3 Designs of Security auf dem Channel 28C3. Then we would have a complete understanding of mathematics, and we wouldn't, you know, we, we could call mathematics done, and we could move on. Um, so Church and Turing work on this independently for a while, and both of them come up with the answer: no, nope, sorry, doesn't work. Um, now, what's interesting about um, another interesting thing that falls out of this is uh, a thing called the Curry-Howard correspondence, um, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, Conceptually, it's uh, it's easier actually to think about uh, about the halting problem in terms of in terms of a thing called Russell's paradox. So back on November second, there was a general strike uh, in Oakland and elsewhere, um, and Quinn Norton, um, who's embedded with uh, it, she's embedded uh, with Occupy right now, writing for Wired, says, "Huh, well, you know, I want to go to the general strike, but if I go, I'm going to be working." Oops. This is this is Russell's paradox in a nutshell. You know, normally the, uh, the the normal way this is phrased is also is is also called the barber paradox, where you've got a village um, where uh, mm. the barber shaves every man who doesn't shave himself. So who shaves the barber? Um, a, a, as a funny side note, by the way, the uh, the smartass answer to this one is well, let the barber be a woman, and that's actually not such a wise ass answer after all. That's actually pretty clever because it means you're introducing types, and that actually renders it decidable. Um, <laughs> Absolutely not worth it here. Um, If you're into that in. kind of type theory, come talk to me afterwards because I want to meet you. <laughs> All right. So I mentioned the Curry, the Curry Howard correspondence earlier. Programs are proofs and vice versa. This means that an exploit is also a proof, and it's the best kind of proof because it's a proof by construction, and those are really fucking easy to understand. Um, we're working on establishing a formal duality of this so that we can like convince the academics of it. But you know, I, part of why I love proofs by construction is that you can basically just look at them and go, "Oh, that's obvious. That's easy to show people how that works." All right. So as we said earlier, inputs are a language. Some languages are harder to recognize than others, and for some of them, recognition is undecidable. So what kinds of languages do we even have? Well, there's a hierarchy. Noam Chomsky came up with it. So the simplest class of languages are the regular languages. Uh, you might also know them as regular expressions or finite state automata. Uh, then there's the context-free languages, the context-sensitive languages, and the recursively enumerable languages, which are uh, and the recursively enumerable languages are the ones that are equivalent to Turing machines. Um, these categories are hierarchical, and different categories have different properties that we can use to our benefit. Okay, so finite state machines just have very simple nesting. Um, they can use delimiters. They can have repetition. Um, so, so if you look at that graph up there, you know that's you start at the start state, um, and as you accept characters from an input string, you move from one state to another. And if and if once you've finished all those transitions and consumed all your input, if you're in state seven, then you're good. You've matched your input. You've matched the input to your language. If not, then it rejects. Trying to match recursively nested structures with or with regular expressions fails, which is why when you try to use regular expressions to parse HTML, Zalgo comes out of the walls and eats your soul. <laughs> If you want to match recursively nested structures, you can do this with with what's called a pushdown automata, which you obtain by taking a finite state machine and adding a stack to it, and then you can balance parentheses to arbitrary depth, and and everything's golden. But there are other there, there are other properties that uh, that we see in protocols that uh, that don't fall into this category. If you have a protocol with a length field in it, like oh I don't know HTTP, TCP, pretty much every protocol out on the internet, just about, uh, with the exception of ATM, that one's regular, which is kind of awesome. But anyway, um, those require a context-sensitive grammar. Um, you know, if if there is some metadata that is necessary in order to interpret the rest of the data, then that's when you're context sensitive. And finally, you're Turing complete if you are saying, is this input some program that produces some given result? That's undecidable. 
Um, a guy named Rice uh, formulated this in the term uh, uh, in what's called Rice's theorem, which is which reduces to the halting problem. All right. So our language hierarchy again. What this tells us is we need to stop weird machines. <laughs> and we can do this by constraining input language strength to context-free or regular. Is this all about parser bugs? Well, no, but that, that, that is an awful lot of it. Um, if you are a component of a program and you receive an input from something, you have a recognizer whether you formally wrote it as a, whether it was formally written as a recognizer or not. It could be a shotgun parser, and in that case, it sucks to be you, because if the recognizer doesn't actually match the language, then it's broken. And if the language itself is not well defined or understood, or if it's underspecified, <coughs> it's N1, the program is broken. All right. And when I say languages, I mean quite literally every formal system that, that, that we use in software. I'm talking about network stacks, because the format of a packet is a language. I'm talking about web servers, SQL servers, et cetera, because you know, their requests form a language. Um, but it's, it, it gets better than Boss that. Is huge to you know, even just on a single system, your memory manager, the heap that, you know, that, 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 that assigns memory, that's a language. The call graph is a language. And, 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 that, and that one likes to be context sensitive, it really does. Um, and most of, most of these language recognizers crap. are hand rolled, and that's bad. There was no crap in there, right? It's just a recognizer. Bad recognizers because yep. you cannot efficiently and effectively test or debug when you're when you're intermingling your recognition and your processing. Like if you just recognize a part of it, and then uh, if you just recognize a part of an input string and do something based on that, and then recognize another part of it and do something else else based on that, you're gonna end up with data flows and transitions that give you a weird machine. It's running on state that it borrowed from the rest of the program. So, if you haven't recognized it, don't goddamn process it. If, if, you, if you have not confirmed that an, in, that an input string is actually a member of the input language you want to process and you try to process it as one anyway, you open yourself up to letting an attacker program the weird machine that's lurking inside your implementation. So you need to know and be strict about what your input language is. And this should be easier than people seem to think it is because you know we have RFCs. They have convenient grammars in nice, shiny BNF notation in the appendix. We, we, we can and should generate these automatically rather than hand coding them because really, who's got the time for all of that? We're programmers, we're hackers. It's our job to be creatively lazy. So it's important to know how much computational power you need to recognize a given language so that you don't do dumb shit like trying to parse a nested structure with a regex. Um, but once you've done that, you can generate it and then hand the resulting, uh, the, the resulting parse tree off to the internals of your code and let the rest of it, and, and let your code operate ah. for that parse tree. What's this in? But please. No more Turing complete input languages. Don't let the Turing beast devour her safe computing future. Was my ender chest weird? So as I've said before, um, the regular languages are a safe place to be. Um, What have you done? Reg regex syntax is terrible, but people understand it for the most part. It can stand to be better but people understand it better than they understand everything else. And you know, part of the problem there is that we just don't have really good tools yet for um, handling, uh, you know, for, for handling um, higher classes of languages. People are still kind of starting to wrap their heads around parser combinators and uh, really nobody likes bison. Um, but you know, the tools are out there and we're working on making better ones. But where this matters really is in design. We must reduce computing power greed and keep the Turing beast from eating our investments. So ja, Leute, das war's dann wohl hier mit der Ender Chest. Oh. Most of what I was talking about yeah. there previously had to do with the single system case. 
Now let's talk about systems that are communicating between each other. Does, uh, you know, is what, is, is what you're seeing the same as what they're seeing? You know, the story doesn't end if there's, if there's no, if there's no shell chest first. So, across interfaces is where we need to minimize the complexity of parsers and recognizers. So, like I said in the beginning, it's the, it's the communication boundaries that, you know, that we really care about. It is necessary for parsers that are involved in a multi-system exchange to parse those messages in exactly the same way um, because if you don't, then it becomes really easy for an attacker to generate something that one system regards in one light and another system regards in another light. Now you might you might be saying, oh, but the, this all so, is, it all, this all sounds so theoretical. Nope, sorry. Um, so two years ago, um, Len and Dan Kaminsky and I um, beat the hell out of X509 in pretty much exactly this way, and we came up with about 20 different ways that you could generate a CSR, send it off to a CA that was uh, that's running, you know, some particular uh, some particular version of X509 get back a certificate, show that to a browser that uh, is using a different X509, X509 implementation, um, and that browser believes that the certificate you got signed is a valid certificate for a domain you don't own. Um, you can take a look at uh, our, uh, our talk uh, from Black Hat, uh, I think it was 2010, yeah, Exploiting the Forest with Trees. Uh, for more details on this one because it's full of lulls. Um, but really, this is the halting problem again, just in a different form. You know, I mentioned that Rice's theorem reduces to the halting problem. They are, they are functionally equivalent. There is another problem that reduces to halting called the context-free equivalence problem. Um, so the context-free languages uh, fall into sort of two subclasses. You have the, the unambiguous context-free grammars, uh, also known as the deterministic pushdown automata, um, and the ambiguous context-free grammars. If you are trying, which are which correspond to the non-deterministic pushdown automata. So, if your language is regular or deterministic pushdown, then determining whether two implementations are actually doing the same, the exact same thing, that's decidable and that's fine, and you can actually automate that. But if your if your ambiguous context-free are stronger. This problem is undecided. And we run into this in IDSs too, which is kind of wacky. Um, you know, if, if, if your problem is that you have a shotgun parser in your code and you say, well, fine, we'll just throw a less vulnerable component in front of it, then you, all you've done is move the problem to another layer because instead of, you know, because instead of your, your target code and, uh, uh, and a possible attacker, you know, speaking different lives, speaking different dialects of the same of, of the same protocol, as it were. Now it's just your IDX talking to it. So you know, you, you haven't really helped any. All you've done is just moved it around. Um, and and you know, this this is this is research that people have been doing for a while. You know, uh, uh, Patechik and Newsham in 1998, um, Bern Paxson in 1999. They've all observed this. Um, they just weren't thinking about it in terms of the, the broader computability picture. But that's okay, that's what, that, that's, that's what academics are here for. <laughs> so once you've created a computational automaton of a particular strength, the genie is out of the bottle and there's no going back from that. Um, the dark energy will resurface elsewhere in your code all you, all you haven't, you haven't solved the halting problem. You've just moved it into a different instance of the halting problem. So, when you are designing protocols, it is vital to choose the simplest possible input language, preferably regular, um, but certainly no stronger than deterministic context-free. Um, and and this, this, this sounds kind of, this sounds kind of intimidating, right? Because it, but, because you think, well, but, 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 but Meredith, you said that, 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 that length fields make a protocol context sensitive and, that, and doing that comparison is undecidable. You know, how can, we, how can we survive without length fields? And 
you know, my answer to that is, um, you know, we have these nice things called S expressions. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. If you can, oh if you can god. Found, um, a, a, a message with, uh, you know, with, with delimiters, that's still deterministic context free. You can get away with this. You know, it, it, it requires different approaches um, than the ones that we have gotten used to in the last 30 years of internet protocol design. Um, but this is okay, you know, we can, we, the, because the other tools that, uh, that I'm talking about have also been around for, you know, for even longer. But at the end of the day, the crucial thing is we must have computational equivalence at all protocol endpoints. Liet. Es geht hier ab. All right. So, lurking back at the very, very, very early days of the, of the IETF, um, is a thing called Pascal's principle, uh, which simply stated is be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. Now, I, I don't mean to bust, on, to bust on John Pascal unnecessarily. I mean, Pascal's principle was absolutely necessary at the beginning. Uh, die konnte man noch mal weiterwerfen, das kann man auch keiner sehen. We were figuring all this shit out as we were going along. You know, and we needed the flexibility that Pascal's principle afforded us. But the ah, problem is that sein. people kind of misread be liberal in what you accept as either be lazy in what you accept or don't worry so much about being kind of a dick and changing the protocol and sending other stuff because other people have to be liberal about what they're accepting and so they'll just accept our crap anyway. Microsoft. So we're proposing that Postel's principle needs a patch and it looks a little something like this. Instead of be liberal about what you accept, we say be definite about what you accept. Treat inputs as a language, accept them with a matching computational automaton, generate the recognizer from the grammar of the language, treat input handling computational power as privilege, and reduce that privilege wherever it is possible to do so. All right, so the takeaway for today, do not let your protocols grow up to be turned complete. People will try. <laughs> People will tell you, oh, well, we need, all, we need these special cases. We need, you know, the, we need to handle this weird corner case. We need to, you know, we need to keep bolting on other stuff and make other things possible. No, disbelieve the illusion that, that down that way lies madness. Because if your application relies on a true and complete protocol, it is going to take infinite time to secure it. <laughs> you know, don't mistake complexity for functionality. It's an easy mistake to make, <laughs> but don't let somebody sell you on it. I mean, if, if, somebody's, if somebody's trying to sell you on, you know, saving money on future upgrades thanks to extensibility, Take a second look at that and make sure that you're not going to lose money on, you know, on security and mediation and remediation because the Turing beast has come and bit you in the ass. You know, if somebody tells you that, you know, oh, well, you know, this system is like totally extensible and updatable because it embeds a scripting language in data, run, 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 in-band signaling, bad, very bad. You know, and the practical value here is that you're saving money and you're saving effort. And you can also expose vendors who are claiming that um, they have what amounts to a solution to the perpetual motion problem. Um, you know, this, this helps you choose the right components in order to have security that you can manage. It also helps you avoid system aggregation and integration nightmare scenarios because if you know that all of your systems have composable, uh, speak composable protocols, and all of the systems that you're going to be composing them with have composable protocols, it all fits together like Legos. So our approach helps people to save misinvestment of money and effort, expose vendors that claim security based on following perpetual motion. You set this light in their place, sir. <laughs> Sorry about that, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this one. <laughs> wow, you put it in there three times, that was kinda great. <laughs> All right, so again, stop weird machines, no more Turing complete input languages, reduce computing power degrees, 
Ambiguity is insecurity. Full recognition before processing. Computational equivalence for all protocol endpoints. And context for your regular bitches. There are your slogans. Have fun with them. Thank you. protocols that uh, that that are that are only regular, you know, which is which is a thing that needs to change. I did mention earlier that uh, that ATM happens to happens to be a regular message format um, because uh, all packets are of a fixed length, um, which is which is a handy thing. If you're uh, if if you know all of your strings are exactly 53 bytes and and only that, then um, you then you can actually specify that with a finite state machine. That said, I don't know of any implementations that use a regular expression to parse ATM, which is sad. Okay, now a question from the mighty internet. Yeah, Crocodilian from Erk asks um, if there are any tools that generate parsers uh, in different languages than BNF. Right, so uh, the question was, are there any tools that generate parsers in different languages than BNF? And the answer is yes. Um, so I mentioned parser combinators earlier. Um, so th these these are uh, uh, well, they're both a mathematical abstraction and a oh, practical fuck, library Feuer. in a bunch Boah. of different languages. Um, can, so anders that, um, can actually parse um, <coughs> the, 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 they, they can actually parse some of the context sensitive languages, which is really neat. Um, the, so you know how when you're building a regular expression, you're essentially just banging smaller regular expressions together. Um, that's essentially how parser combinators work, but they also admit recursion. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Don Lyon uh, invented, uh, I totally botched that pronunciation, I'm sorry. Um, but he, yeah, he invented them um, back in, it was only a couple years ago, actually. Um, and so, th so they were initially, uh, they initially showed up here. in Haskell, um, but since then they've crept into Scala, I think also Clojure, Python, JavaScript. Um, you know, so the, the, the tools are starting to creep into um, into more and more um, into into more and more commonly used languages. If you're interested in learning about parser combinators, I really recommend checking out um, the parser combinator standard library in Scala um, because it it looks a lot like Java, um, and there's a lot of really good material out there on using Scala to write um, embedded DSLs. Um, Using using parser combinators um, and the tutorial the tutorials out there are way better than anything I could give you in you know in five minutes here. Over there. Hi. Um, so Soll ich noch mal schlafen, the, bevor ich in die Hölle gehe? Uh, the halting problem and Turing complete uh, input languages. Yes. Um, but I think pretty often we don't care about. Uh, is it going to take finite time to, to uh, handle this input? We care, is it going to take a reasonable time? Um, and even with regular expressions, there are certainly plenty of regular expressions that, and a regular expression library implementations have cases where they will take exponential time. Sure, yeah, pathological cases, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Um, so. Well, so my bigger concern, my, my bigger concern, um, yeah, no, so yeah, tractability, obviously a huge problem, but really my bigger concern about um, Turing complete input languages is, um, is, the, is the programming the weird machine problem. Um, so there was this hilarious result um, on GitHub um, a couple of months ago where um, somebody proved that HTML5 and CSS Together, uh, HTML5 and CSS3 together, but without JavaScript, 
his turn complete. What? He did it by implementing Rule 110 for cellular automata using only HTML5 and CSS. Was? He was brilliant <clears throat> and demented. What? Um, yeah, but and the fucked up thing about it is that you could use <clears throat> that construction to do arbitrary computation in what is supposed to be only a markup language and its associated display components. I mean, how fucked up is that? Heads up. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you could give an example of how to work ar um, around these length fields, um, because I think that's not that easy if you're trying to build something that can transport arbitrary user strings. Um, I've run into um, some interesting uh, CSV files lately. Um, CSV is probably uh, can probably be implemented with a with a regular um, uh, no, context sensitive grammar. But you run into interesting things when you have uh, arbitrary input strings in your CSV that can contain, for example, uh, a line break or it can contain commas or whatever. Right, right. Well, and so, and, and you've really just hit on it right there because a CSV uh, a CSV message is a is comma separated values, um, and if those values are also allowed to contain commas. Um, then you've got an in-band signaling problem where the, you know, where how is the interpreter supposed to determine whether that comma is part of a value or whether it's, um, or whether it's a, a delimiter between values. Um, and of course, the, the off-the-cuff answer to that one is well escaping, but yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just refer you to the last 20 years of SQL injection um, with regard to that one. No, so I, you know, I mentioned I mentioned S expressions earlier. Um, you know, those those come from Lisp, um, land of parentheses, um, and so the idea there is that you just have um, some set of delimiters that are not that, that are not part of the uh, the the sub language that describes values. Because, um, like, you know, what 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 what? So when I think of a length field, I think of a value that tells me how many bytes to expect. Um, it doesn't really hurt you to say, okay, well, rather than say, rather than saying, all right, expect 42 bytes and then count the next 42 bytes. If you instead have opening delimiter, consume, 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 consume until you see closing delimiter, and you're done. You know, as long as those opening and closing delimiters are not part of the sub language that describes um, what appears between them. You know, you can get away with this. Um, does yeah, that does that answer your question? Is <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure it does. Kinda, um, because I think that that's just my point. It's easier in some cases to just have a length delimited field um, instead of building this parser with all the escaping just to be able to handle arbitrary user input. Um, the, simply because I've run across, shall we say, broken and badly defined CSVs in the past. Sure. Sure. Right? Absolutely. And, yeah, well, and, and, and again, you know, badly, badly defined things. Looks like Surya actually has some input. Come on up here. So, you see, uh, you're right. It's counterintuitive. Why would I bring a parser if I can skip over so many bytes, right? Why should I uh, implement the proper uh, escaping discipline and the proper uh, scanning and parsing if I can just skip some bytes. But all bytes are really created equal. And when you're seeing these bytes, when you're seeing these bytes, you don't know which ones are data, which ones are metadata. Uh, packet and packet is based on that. Packet and packet is based essentially on the uh, really simple uh, machine within the uh, digital radio chip. A kind of sort of um, giving you so many bytes uh, uh, for your frame. It turns out that despite the simplicity, it doesn't work so well because uh, you mistake your data bytes for your metadata bytes, and the whole scheme, the whole encapsulation, goes out of the window, right? So. This is basically the science part of it. There is uh, a thing.
that seems simple, but is actually fraught with danger. And you need to do a more complex thing, but that's actually principled and can be proven to be principled, can be proven to require less computational power in the end. Think of parsing a, uh, an IP packet. Uh, worse, think of parsing an IPv6 packet. <laughs> right? Imagine your pointer pointing into that packet. Do you know what you're looking at? When you're writing the internal code, do you know which properties about the packet have been validated already? And whether your assumptions uh, when you are operating off of that pointer and uh, happily casting uh, into your structs and uh, doing something with the values, do you know which uh, assumptions are actually truly trustworthy given the previous sanity checking or not? Uh, you don't. You uh, start in this land of you know mixed data and metadata and you get the mess that we're dealing with uh, basically every day. Uh, the reason for this is protocols that use the simpler thing, such as quote unquote simpler thing, such as length fields. You are starved for context when you're in your internal code, when you were supposed to have checked uh, all the sanity, all the um, uh, you know, all the various assumptions about whether this is good data that needs to be trusted and not checked at every turn. Because you can't really check data at every turn. Uh, where do you stop? Right? Also, just one, one quick addition to that. Um, you know, the, the exception to the context-free equivalence problem for, say, context-sensitive languages with length fields in them is as long as you're generating your implementation from the exact same grammar, you know, if, if, if two implementations you know, it generate their input handling routines from the same grammar, then those are guaranteed to be the same. Modulo, you know, the compiler fucking you. Um. <laughs> yeah, remind me later. <laughs> Darp. All right. Uh, how much time do we have left? We have another 10 minutes, so we can take another question okay. from IRC. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I apologize. This is, uh, was a parser fuck up. Apparently, the question about BNF I asked before was not other things than BNF, but generating uh, parsers in different languages like C from actual BNF representations. So if there are any... Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I misunderstood you, no, my bad, I mis okay. I misunderstood the... Oh, okay, well, so, um, you know, the, your, your standard uh, your, your standard C tool for that is uh, Yak, yet another compiler compiler, um, or the, the GNU version, which is Bison. Um, and the, um, the input language that, um, that, uh, that, both, that, that both of these tools use is literally just, you know, straight up BNF. So somebody, somebody mentioned that um, some work ex, uh, require exponential time to execute. Um, this is only true if you um, either use a backtracking implementation or add features like back references. So plain work apps don't really have this problem. And and the other thing about backtracking regular expressions is that like you know, like like PCRE regular expressions is that um, they they have a stack. They're, they're actually context free. So yeah. Yeah. Just a big. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, but you see, it's not really the running time that should concern you. It's trying to solve an unsolvable problem when validating input. Yeah, I mean, the real, pro the real problem that we want to solve is let's stop exposing weird machines because that way we cut the thread of malware off at the knees. You, may, you must make sure that when data reaches the processing logic, it has been checked and you are fully certain what is it that you are operating on. If you don't, you've got the explosion of state, you've got probably transitions 
uh, that you did not anticipate, and you've got that computation, that, that unexpected computation that is otherwise known as being pwned. Right? So when we say that uh, an exploit is proof, it's proof by construction that a computation is possible in the actual environment that uh, you are exploiting. You know, you can't argue with proofs. This is science. Yeah. When you try to argue with reality, reality wins. Okay, another question from the internet. Uh, Wal Yu Gang Yu asks, uh, what your opinion is on the trend to invent ad hoc proprietary protocols between JavaScript apps and browsers and their servers? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, what your opinion is on the trend to the trend, trend to invent ad hoc proprietary protocols between JavaScript applications in browsers and their servers? Oh, so you're talking you're talking about like you know RESTful APIs and stuff like that? Yeah, so I'm not a huge fan of proprietary protocols in the first instance. Um, yeah, you know, I can't stop people from shooting themselves in the foot. I can, I can advise them to put the gun down, but I can't stop them. Well, you should realize that before Estful was invented, CGI was an even bigger mess. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> you know, whatever the hell was in that URL, <laughs> how would you even start making sense of it? Which things there were objects, which ones were methods or actions or messages? At least RESTful gives you an opportunity to start structuring that. But. Yeah, we're not looking forward to the uh, uh, Turing complete web application feature. I can't stop. Okay, so we're doing one more question. Okay, then the uh, more important one. Um, several people ask uh, how about using how it is about using length fields for performance, like in Travis Talk and uh, the other one. And then the limiters for certainty. I, I, the, I missed everything after performance. Sorry. Okay. I'm half deaf. I'm, I'm bad. Okay. Using in, in protocols, using length fields for performance, and then additionally the limiters for certainty. So, I, I, I think I think performance is really a red herring. For that, um, I want to refer you to uh, Matt Might and guy whose first name I don't remember, Darius's paper from 2010 called "Yak is Dead," um, where they blow up the uh, the myth about um, parsing being like, you know, impractically heavy and and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I I. I I have not seen uh, like real world runtime real world runtime statistics comparing um, uh, comparing say uh, context free to context sensitive with length fields, but we could gin that up, and I, I I'd be willing to place a bet right now um, that that context free will actually win on performance. Also consider that by including both the length and the delimiter. You've just created uh, a semantic ambiguity because you see, what do you think the implementers would do? Some of them would go by uh, the length field, others by the delimiter. <laughs> you know, and you, you'll you'll have the wonderful world of IDS evasion all over again. By the way, if you were there for uh, Dan Kaminsky's talk, uh, the conclusion of it, the. Uh, uh, tricks to reveal your ISPs doing computation you don't want to be them to be doing on your packet, exposing the fact that they are doing this computation? Well, you know, this is the old world of IDS evasion writing again, showing that if you don't have computational equivalence, it's damn hard to, uh, to hide it. And it's easy enough to expose it. So. Don't uh, rely on ambiguity for security, because ambiguity is insecurity. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
give a huge round of applause for this awesome talk, please. Um, just be before you all leave, I heard, uh, Meredith, I heard stories about your lab coat. So could you come here, please? And um, Can we please close all doors and put the house lights down? So, because we have something to show here. All right, so my dad is a chemical engineer, um, worked for Exxon his entire career, and before he was born, uh, he spent some time in the research lab there. Um, and when my mom, who I, uh, I visited my parents for Christmas in Houston, and when my mom heard about the O'Day lab coats thing, she was like, oh, cool, and went and dug my dad's old lab coat from the research lab out of storage, the one that I used to play dress up in when I was a little girl. And I was like, okay, well, but, you know, this is CCC. It, it, it needs to have art in it. Um, so I decided to go ahead and bling it out a little bit um, with some uh, with some UV decorations, um, and I guess they're working on the light problem there. So yeah, um, this this is not the very best lab coat in the world. This is just a tribute. That's fun. And I want to thank Dan and Travis again for, for putting this art in the Bitcoin blockchain because it really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Okay, lights back on, please. Wow, jetzt kann ich sie nicht mitnehmen, weil ich meinen Dings nicht hab. Bleat. Yeah. Okay. Was fliegt denn da oben? Crazy. Ja, okay. Ähm. Ach, no, tut das weh. Äh, das war's dann wohl mit ähm, dieser Episode und mit meiner Ender Chest. Ähm, ja, das war 28C3, The Science of Insecurity auf dem YouTube-Channel 28C3. Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Die haben bei 17 Minuten und 30 Sekunden oder so angefangen. Ähm, oh mein Gott. Äh, und ja, das mache ich dann in der nächsten Folge hier losfahren. Genau. Ja, das ist hier Lasergucknet mit der Domain sillyhuhn.com. Alternativ auch die IP-Adresse, die da steht. Also dann von 2.1.134. Und wir sehen uns dann in der nächsten Folge. Ciao.